Good evening, uh, everybody. Welcome to Dorsey. Uh, my name is Wallace Bao, uh, a corporate attorney uh, with the U.S. China Practice Group of um, the law firm Dorsey Whitney, an international law firm. Uh, on behalf of the firm, let me say it's our great honor and privilege to provide this evening's venue for yet another of the National Committee's highly popular events. Uh, we're all looking forward to hearing the speaker today, Professor Li, share his many insights on a very topical subject in these very interesting times. Introducing Professor Li today will be Mr. Steve Orleans, President of the National Committee, and I believe one of the most vocal advocates in this country for stronger U.S.-China relations, someone that the two countries need today more than ever at this critical juncture in the relations of these two great nations. Steve, please. Wallace, thank you, um, and thank yeah, anyway, both thank you and thank Nelson Dong, our part, uh, a partner here at Dorsey, who is on the board of the National Committee and created the relationship which allows us to have these events at this venue. Um, this was originally scheduled to be done in our office, but we got such a huge turnout that we had to move it here, which is a testimony to the subject that you chose, that Professor, that Professor Lee chose for the, his book. He called it the clash of capitalisms which is Chinese companies in the United States, which he is going to, you're going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes? And then we'll open the floor to questions, and obviously there's an enormous amount going on um, in U.S.-China trade. So we won't restrict questions to, to uh, the book, but if you want to go beyond that, since Professor Lee is also expert in those areas, you can ask about things beyond the book. But it's um, obviously a subject of enormous importance and of enormous interest to the National Committee, as I think everybody knows, and as we've done in this room, we annually have a study of Chinese investment in the United States, which we conduct with the Rhodium Group, and of U.S. investment in China, which is also done with the Rhodium Group, and we do this comparative analysis of sectors that are open, how open they are, equity caps, and various other things. But let's, I'm interested in hearing this data. Uh, the book, as Professor Lee has pointed out, is for sale outside. It's a little more expensive than the normal books we're promoting at these events, but it's for, it's for law students and, uh, and academics. But thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. And let's hear what you have to say. All right, thank you. Uh, first, thanks to Steve and, uh, and Marco and everyone else at the National Committee for hosting this talk. This is a great uh, platform for introducing this book and uh, also for discussing this uh, very important uh, and timely topic. And thanks for everyone uh, for being here. Um, so this book, um, I uh, started working on it uh, several years ago when, um, and uh, entered into a collaboration with uh, China General uh, Chamber of Commerce in the U.S. and they started to collect uh, annual survey data and uh, help them design the survey questions and, uh, and um, they published um, annual um, survey report and I got to use the data for my research. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win situation. Um, so What are the questions that I try to address in this book? Um, so first of all, the background. Um, once um, people started to observe a surge of Chinese as uh, outbound uh, direct investment, it started to, uh, a debate uh, started, and um, there are two opposing views. On the one hand, uh, people argue that um, Chinese investment should be welcome, just like the investment from other countries. Um, the previous uh, administration was uh, took that attitude, uh, fully welcome Chinese investment um, in the U.S. Uh, on the other hand, um, there are um, people who are more skeptical. They argue that Chinese foreign investments actually bring Chinese problems, domestic problems, to their host countries. So we heard reports about uh, labor abuse by Chinese foreign investors. 
um, a, a stress posed by Chinese companies investing in U.S. Um, uh, startups and uh, companies with sensitive technologies and whatnot. So the debate continued, but there had not been a systematic empirical research that explore the topic. More specifically, people haven't, scholars haven't really explored how Chinese companies adapt to U.S. legal and regulatory institutions. And that's the topic of this book. All right, so uh, the book answers two questions. First, whether and how do Chinese companies in the U.S. comply with U.S. law? So ZTE should be a, a case that come up in mind. Uh, do most Chinese companies in the U.S. behave like ZTE when they react to U.S. laws and regulations? Uh, if, oh, we hope the answer is no, um, but if no, um, then what, what are the differences? Um, and second, uh, also for, for most scholars, that's probably the more important question, the more interesting question, questions, whether ownership, ownership structure of Chinese companies or Chinese investors makes a difference. And there are a lot of Chinese investments in the U.S. This, uh, uh, that are, were initiated by state-owned enterprises. Uh, something very, uh, from U.S. perspective, very strange and, and suspicious. So um, does ownership, uh, ownership structure make a difference when it comes to Chinese companies' adaptation to U.S. institutions? Um, um, so, so Steve mentioned the, the Rhodium uh, uh, report each year conducted with the uh, National Committee. It's a very useful and very important uh, uh, report. Um, it, it collects data, uh, objective investment data each year, um, um, Chinese investment in the U.S. My uh, study approached the question from the other side of the coin. I look at how Chinese investors actually uh, uh, think or perceive of U.S. institutions. And I look at uh, companies uh, from this side and I look at how they are able or willing to um, comply with U.S. laws and regulations. And the, uh, the data comprises mainly of uh, survey data over three years. Um, so um, the, I um, normally uh, introduce uh, the Gen China General Chamber of Commerce. Um, uh, just because of time constraints, I'll just say um, this is the most prominent uh, business association of Chinese companies in the U.S. and uh, almost all sizable Chinese companies are members of this uh, organization. So this data set uh, is very informative and uh, uh, quite comprehensive. So that served the purpose of this research pretty well. And um, so this chart just shows you that the membership is very diverse. Um, and the location of their investments quite uh, uh, evenly uh, distributed. Um, so you see different uh, uh, California, New York, uh, uh, Illinois, and Texas are major uh, destinations for Chinese investments. All right, so um, this is my main analytical framework. So the big question is how do Chinese companies react to host country laws and what are the impacts, right? Uh, do Chinese companies cause disruptions of the existing institutions of their host countries, or do they fully adapt and behave like their local counterparts? So here's, I, I propose a two-step analysis. The first step, you need to look at the institutional distance between China and the, EU, and the US in a specific subject, ma subject matter area. And on that, um, you need to look at not only the formal law dis uh, differences between China and the U.S., you also need to look at how laws are enforced in the U.S. versus China. And if the distance is very small, then the Chinese companies simply by behaving just like what they did in China will not cause any disruption to the U.S., to the existing U.S. institution in that specific area. But if the gap is large, 
then you have to move on to the second step, and you have to ask two questions, whether the Chinese companies have the, both the desire and the ability to adapt to the host country institution. And if the answer to both is yes, then the Chinese company will behave just like their local counterpart. There will be no major disruption to the institution, to the to specific US institution. So this all sounds very um, abstract and general. And I'll get to, to the details in a minute. But this is the general analytical framework. It should be applied to all, uh, the, uh, all, all analysis of Chinese uh, companies' adaptation to US institutions. All right, so uh, first we start with institutional distance. So um, right now, the literature uh, has used this term in this very broad sense. So you, um, you know, the, the existing studies uh, argue that there's a huge institutional distance between China and the U.S. because the U.S. is a rule of law system, China is a rule by law system, and the U.S. is democracy, China is authoritarian regime, uh, the U.S. is a liberal market capitalism, China is either a crony capitalism or uh, a state uh, capitalism and whatnot. Those are the arguments are too broad. We need to take a, I argue, we need to take a more nuanced approach. When we talk about Chinese companies' compliance with US laws, we have to look at laws in different areas. For example, in certain areas, legal transplants uh, basically transformed the Chinese legal system in ways so that we observe a convergence. For example, Chinese antitrust law, contract law, IP law, they all look very much similar to US laws in those areas. Of course, there are differences, but if you look at IP law and antitrust law, uh, you see the fundamental principles of the Chinese laws resemble what you see here in the US. So in those areas, uh, there are not significant institutional distances. So if Chinese companies are familiar with uh, Chinese IP law, contract law. When they engage in contractual compliance or compliance with US IP law, at least at the formal compliance level, there will be not much, uh, uh, there's, there will be not uh, many challenges. But of course, the second uh, uh, layer of the analysis, uh, law enforcement distance, that's uh, in certain areas can be can be wide, right? IP law is a, is a good example in China, even though the IP law on the book uh, resembles uh, U.S. IP law, its enforcement still lag way behind uh, US, uh, the uh, U.S. enforcement of, of IP law. So I have to uh, speed up uh, a little bit. Uh, the, uh, so that's the first step analysis. You look at institutional distance. The second step, um, I break it up into different uh, sub-level analysis. Uh, analysis. First, uh, uh, the desire to adapt, right? The desire to adapt, uh, again, is an abstract and broad concept. I look at two questions. One, investment motives, right? Um, for that, I ask whether the Chinese investors uh, invest in the US for commercial purpose uh, or home state policy, well, whether their investment is driven by home state policy. On the other hand, I ask how, whether they are committed to long-term investment in the US. And if yes, uh, the answer is yes to both questions, then uh, Chinese investors will demonstrate a very strong desire to adapt and act like uh, US companies. They want to behave uh, just like their local uh, counterparts. They want to settle down. Um, but if the answer is no, then there will be, a, 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 you, you will probably see a weak uh, desire to, to adapt um, to US institutions. And then the perceptions of whole state institutions is from the, uh, the vast literature about uh, legal compliance, right? Uh, there's compliance not only driven by cost, uh, r rational cost benefit analysis, it's also a correlates with people's perception of the institution. If uh, a, a citizen perceive an institution to be illegitimate, they will resist compliance. So 
the question is, do Chinese investors perceive U.S. institutions as legitimate or not? <coughs> All right, so um, for the second leg of the analysis, the ability to adapt, I uh, ask two different questions. One is allocation of decision-making power. Whether compliance decisions are made locally or by managers in headquarters in Beijing, that makes a huge difference, right? Uh, if you want to make efficient, effective decisions, uh, compliance decisions, you want local managers with first-hand knowledge, with uh, a, a better understanding of the local institution to be making the decisions, not the Chinese headquarters. On the other hand, reliance on local knowledge, right? For anyone who has filed tax return in the U.S., you understand that compliance with US, U.S. tax law is beyond uh, anyone's uh, <laughs> capacity. Uh, so you need to delegate that to the accountants or tax lawyers, right? So whether or not Chinese investors rely on U.S. professionals, that's a very important question for their <coughs> compliance behavior. All right, so um, those are the questions that we have to address before we understand the compliance behavior, uh, behavior of Chinese companies in the U.S. So um, um, on the general first, first question, first level of the analysis, uh, institutional distance between China and the U.S., I, I made some broad uh, uh, arguments. Uh, generally speaking, the institutional gap is huge, especially at the law enforcement level, but it varies across different areas. And this is uh, uh, data from 2016 survey. So we asked specifically how uh, about the legal and compliance costs incurred by Chinese investors in the U.S. Uh, as you can see, as you can see, um, most of the Chinese investors consider their compliance cost in the U.S. to be much higher or higher than their compliance cost in China, which is not surprising at all, right? Um, and the desire to adapt to U.S. institutions, um, so with two questions, remember, uh, one is investment uh, motives, the other is uh, short-term or long-term commitment to U.S. Uh, operations. So um, as you can see, most of them are here for commercial reasons. Uh, some uh, companies <coughs> report that uh, the Chinese government policy play a major role in their decision, but they are also here, uh, most of them here to explore market, to acquire advanced uh, technology to enhance their international brand recognition, and et cetera. And their perceptions of U.S. institutions uh, is highly positive. This actually, to me, I, I find this a little surprising. Um, so, but, but um, this is, it is what it is. Uh, most Chinese managers here in the U.S. perceive of U.S. Uh, institutions in a highly positive light. This is before Trump, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> I have, we have the 2018 data. I haven't really uh, got the time to, uh, to uh, statistically analyze, uh, analyze the data, but I, I'm sure uh, it will be become less positive. But uh, based on past data, uh, Chinese managers think highly of U.S. institutions in all areas, political institutions, legal institutions, and economic institutions. So um, they really love the U.S. system. Um, with regard to ability to adapt, um, the, uh, well, the fact is mixed, right? Uh, we ask uh, how the Chinese companies allocate their decision-making power with regarding personnel matters. And uh, you, you see that Chinese headquarters retain significant control over the appointment of senior managers, but when it comes to mid-level managers, they delegate uh, to a great extent to local, local managers. So uh, again, uh, you know, I, should, I should mention this uh, at the outset. Um, this is an empirical study, so I don't have a yes, no answer to most questions. What I have is a distribution. So uh, most of the findings pre present a mixed picture. Um, but that's the point I want to make. It is, there's no clear answer to the ZTE question, whether every 
had his company this one to be? Uh, the answer is no. And there's a significant inter-company variations and also variations across, diff across different <coughs> compliance areas, as I, was, uh, I will show you in a minute. All right, um, uh, decision, uh, this just very briefly shows you the decision, how decision uh, making power is allocated when it comes to compliance issues. Um, uh, still, signif well, a uh, significant uh, proportion of the companies allocate um, the, the uh, power to, to either the Chinese headquarters or primarily to, or gave great weight to Chinese headquarters. So this is, uh, well, depends on your perspective. This can be good or can be bad, but uh, it's not very efficient, right, if decisions have to wait. Uh, if U.S. managers have to wait, uh, the, their superiors in China to make decisions about compliance issues, uh, the solution would not be very effective, uh, efficient. And uh, why come? Uh, well, another question is reliance on local professionals. So we, we have we break down that question into different sub questions. Mm -hmm. So this is about in-house counsel. Um, you can see the distribution is quite even. So uh, some companies have in-house counsel, some don't. Uh, two lawyers uh, and law uh, scholars, uh, the, the, second, um, the, the second bar from the right is, is quite interesting. Uh, you don't see that in U.S. companies. Because U.S. companies, when we, when we talk about in-house counsel, they, they understand in-house counsel to be lawyers, right? But for Chinese companies, some of their in-house counsels do not have the license to practice law in the U.S. So in a separate project, I, I'll answer that question. But uh, uh, here, this is something uh, with uh, Chinese uh, characteristics. So, so you, you're an assumption here is that the, the in-house counsel <coughs> is brought from China? No, well, uh, they should be. Well, they should be. Could a it be a local? It could they, be a local qualified counsel. Yeah, it, it could be a Chinese. Actually, most of them are Chinese, but they got their either LLM here or a JD here, and they got licensed. Uh, they became a licensed uh, licensed lawyer in the U.S. But still, uh, many. So of So you're them distinguishing between using outside counsel, who's qualified in the United States, and in-house counsel, who's qualified in the United States. Uh, no, actually, I asked both questions. This is just the first question. I see. Yeah, but the second question is, uh, um, well, this is compliance, whether they have full-time compliance officers. This is another uh, part of the general broader question. Um, uh, well, there's, uh, there's another chart, uh, probably not included. How often they use, uh, actually, is, uh, how often they use U.S. lawyers? Most of them, uh, the vast majority have used U.S. lawyers. Mo uh, many of them use U.S. lawyers frequently. And I, I will use, I'll, I'll analyze that question statistically in a minute. So uh, in general, this is again a still a, a general comparison, a general analysis. So institutional gaps exist, but uh, Chinese companies demonstrate a strong desire to adapt, but their ability to do it uh, may be hampered uh, if, if compliance uh, requires major decisions. Mm -hmm. So the second question, whether state ownership, whether ownership structure of Chinese investors matter. Um, uh, first, uh, institutional distance, uh, as you, uh, many of you know, in some areas, very limited areas, uh, state ownership is a salient matter. But uh, for most US laws, um, ownership structure is not really a concern. Um, so, so the, uh, the institutional dissidences may, uh, well, a state ownership may be an important factor in areas where it is a salient factor, but uh, otherwise it shouldn't. Um, uh, when it comes to the desire to adapt to the US, US institutions, well, we, we look at um, investment motives, right? Um, and here, there's significant evidence that uh, state-owned enterprises are more likely to invest in the U.S. because of um, uh, uh, government policies. Um, and uh, when it comes to the question about short-term or long-term commitment, um, SOEs are less likely to reinvest their profit in the U.S., which suggests that 
they may be l less likely to be a long-term invest uh, investment investors in the U.S. So if you combine both findings, um, there's suggestive evidence that SOEs may not be as willing to adapt to US, U.S. institutions as private Chinese companies. And the question about perceptions of U.S. institutions, um, I run uh, numerous uh, analysis, regression analysis, but I find no systematic uh, significant uh, coefficients. So what does that say? Well, in English, that means it is highly idiosyncratic, right? Whether a Chinese manager likes the U.S. institutions or not totally depends on the personal experience, whether the person is educated in the U.S., whether the uh, person has, uh, how long the person has spent in the U.S. working <coughs> or studying or living. It's totally idiosyncratic. It has nothing to do, uh, you find no systematic factor explaining the variations. The ability to adapt, all right? Um, here, state ownership. Uh, well, first, allocation of decision-making power. So I find a significant and robust uh, finding that state-owned enterprises tend to have a vertical control of their U.S. operations. What does that mean? That means when, if you have a state-owned investor in the U.S. and you have the company making major decisions, then it's very likely the decisions are made in Beijing in the Chinese headquarters, not locally. So for those practitioners who want to develop a business with uh, Chinese state enterprises, the most efficient way is to call their Chinese headquarters, not to call their local managers. Um, and state ownership and the decision to make U.S. compliance a legal matters. Again, state ownership is significant, highly significant and robust. Um, so the negative sign suggests that if you have a major compliance matter, then the decision is made in China by the headquarters, not locally, if this is a state-owned enterprise. Um, and the use of local professionals, and when it comes to um, the use of uh, U.S. lawyers, accountants, consultants, there's really no difference. Uh, state ownership doesn't matter. It seems that SOEs, state-owned enterprises, rely um, U.S. lawyers to the same extent as private Chinese companies. How am I doing on time? <laughs> About four more minutes. Four more minutes. So <laughs> also, I have to sp speed up. Um, so here, uh, I, I briefly refer, uh, mentioned this uh, question. So how frequent do Chinese companies use U.S. lawyers? Does ownership matter? No. Um, they, uh, the only a uh, factor that, that's significant consistently is the size of their U.S. investments. So large Chinese co uh, companies uh, in the U.S. tend to rely more frequently on U.S. lawyers, uh, which is totally uh, intuitive, right? And the state ownership doesn't uh, play a role here. All right, so um, does state ownership matter? The conclusion is yes, especially in the allocation of decision-making power. Um, so if everything else equal, then compl if compliance involves major, major decisions, then state-owned Chinese companies may not react as effectively as private companies in the U.S., or Chinese private companies in the U.S. All right, so um, that's just, I have to speed up. Uh, that's the general findings. <laughs> I, have to I hate to slow you down, but what's, wh how do you establish effect, go back to your previous slide, it says more effectively, what's the, will we act less effectively, what's the So, it, well, the, the, the assumption, uh, here I, I speak, skip uh, a few assumptions. The assumption is that when you have a local compliance matter, you want uh, the matter to be resolved by managers who have access to local knowledge, right? And so effectively is simply determined by using local counsel. Right, well, uh, local knowledge and uh, also um, the information, right? Um, uh, managers in China, they don't have direct access to local knowledge or information, Okay. right? So if you have to wait for the call from the headquarters uh, for various reasons, it will be less efficient. Um, 
maybe more effective, but less efficient. Less efficient. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's some multinationals who might disagree. Right. <laughs> Andy so, knows. Again, this is, you know, um, uh, I, mo basically, I present the data. I, I, all the conclusions here are suggestive. I live, um, it, the, the takeaway from the book is that uh, we should take a nuanced approach to the general question about Chinese companies compliance with US uh, rules, um, laws, and regulations. So uh, the, um, for some reason, it doesn't allow me to move forward. Uh, maybe try, try okay, now. Here. Oh. So then I break, those are the general findings. I break that, uh, those down into three different areas. As I said, when you look at compliance, you have to look at compliance in different subject matter areas. So I look at these three areas. Why? They impact all Chinese investors in the US, right? Employment discrimination, tax. You can't avoid uh, tax compliance. You cannot avoid uh, discrimination, uh, workforce uh, equality rules, and you cannot ignore national security review. Um, so here is the general position uh, they occupy on this chart. So the three dimensions, the institutional distance, ability to adapt, desire to adapt. So you can, hear, uh, you can look at CFIUS. Um, I compare CFIUS with uh, employment discrimination. <coughs> so CFIUS, uh, the institutional distance in that subject matter area is enormous. Why? Not because China doesn't have national security review uh, rules, uh, it does, but uh, they only apply to foreign investors. <laughs> Chinese in, uh, companies never have to worry about uh, national security review uh, uh, regulation in China. But when they come to the US, they have to consider this risk. So that's why the institutional distance is enormous, from zero to 100. Uh, employment discrimination is uh, different. Well, uh, China has already implemented a comprehensive uh, uh, law against uh, uh, employment discrimination. It's borrowed um, primarily from the European rules. Uh, so in principle, it's very similar. Actually, in certain areas, more comprehensive than US uh, employment discrimination laws. So um, at least, well, well of course, uh, the laws and not perfectly enforced in China. So on that aspect, there's huge gap. But every Chinese company, when they invest in the US, from day one, they know that discriminating against uh, uh, employees of uh, minority, uh, 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 of ethnic minority, uh, 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 based on gender, based on race, will be illegal. They all know that. So that's why the institutional distance in that area is not that significant, and tax is uh, somewhere in between. Um, well, and uh, a desire and ability to adapt. Um, so we will look at uh, some data to, to figure that out. Uh, first, the tax. Um, so I, you know, um, this is before the Trump administration in for, uh, did the, uh, well, reformed the U.S. tax system. Uh, he did, uh, that's, uh, he deserves credit for that. I, I teach tax at, uh, at the law school, so uh, it's just a pain in the neck to study U.S. tax law, not to, you know, I can understand how much you hate it. Um, <laughs> so um, all Chinese managers, most of them perceive U.S. tax law to be heavier, actually. So this, uh, is a little counterintuitive because we all know Cao De Wang talked about how heavy Chinese tax uh, uh, had been and how much he loved U.S. tax system. Uh, it doesn't, the, the idea is not shared by most uh, Chinese managers. And more surprisingly, uh, they uh, find the U.S. tax system to be more rational, uh, quite, a few of them consider U.S. tax system to be more rational. I, first, uh, I, I couldn't understand them. I think they, they're crazy. Um, but you know, uh, on, on a second thought, I, I think it makes sense. Um, at least this, you know, there, you consult a lawyer, and lawyer gave you a, a answer. 
But in China, sometimes um, you have to call um, Shui Wu Zong Zhu or Di Shui Zhu to, and the answer may vary from different agents you call. So maybe they like the law-based system more on the uh, agency-based system. Also, uh, another reason to explain the positive view is that, well, here you can see a very positive view of the US tax system. Another reason to explain is that they don't really do the work. They rely heavily on tax professionals, which is not surprising, right? 90% um, of them delegate the work to, ta to accountants. And those who don't, I looked at the companies. They are large companies who probably have already set up uh, uh, internal accounting uh, capacity. Uh, they are able to handle the matters uh, internally. So um, how do they react to US tax system? I, I, don't, I don't think I have time to go through the details. But the, the general idea is that they adapt quickly. They are cautious in terms of complying with US tax law. And the finding is that they, they don't actually get much uh, many audits, uh, which is another, which evidence that their, their, their cautious compliance behavior. And effect of ownership, no. Um, so state-owned enterprises comply with US tax law in similar ways as private Chinese companies. US employment law. Again, very positive view of US employment law, which is somewhat surprising to me, but uh, um, um, I, uh, based on my interviews, uh, even including interview with Cao De Wa, uh, he said, well, the US system is law-based, uh, it's predictable, uh, which is good. Um, and uh, that was before he had uh, union issues. Uh, 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 in his in the factories, He's, he even thought uh, positively of the union system. Um, <laughs> ability to adapt, uh, they, how, how much do they rely on local professionals to, to handle human resource matters? On this, uh, you find mixed uh, results. So uh, not all of them uh, actually have stuff dedicated to human resource matters in the US. And how do they set up their human resource management system in the US? Again, um, not you, you have a mixed finding here. Actually, a, a significant of, uh, a proportion of them still use their Chinese model back home, which, is, which may spell trouble in the future. So, um, and the measures they have taken to prevent employment discrimination, well, you, as you can see, uh, the three bars on the left suggest that they haven't really taken adequate measure to prevent employment discrimination. The two bars on the left are companies that ha haven't really taken basic measures to prevent employment discrimination. So in this area, I would argue that even though, well, well for the time being, many of them haven't really had much trouble with employment discrimination. I think this will be a potential, uh, this will be an area with potential serious problems for Chinese companies because they haven't really adapted to the US system um, uh, to the level adequate for full compliance. Um, the effect of state ownership in this area, not significant. So uh, SOEs are not much different from private chi uh, Chinese companies in terms of complying with uh, workforce, equality, uh, workforce equality rules. National security review, this is the area uh, where state ownership is discriminated uh, against. Uh, the law, the, the uh, state ownership is a salient matter in this uh, law. And the institutional distance, as I mentioned, is significant, right, uh, and the law here the enforcement of law is highly opaque and, and discretionary. Um, so perception of the institution. In contrast to employment discrimination and tax, in this area, most Chinese companies perceive negatively of the institution, which is not surprising, right? Uh, the system is non-transparent uh, non and uh, pol uh, politicized. And whether Chinese companies engage US lawyers uh, for when, they, when they consider exiguous risk, 
Many of them still do, right? So this demonstrates a heavy reliance on local professionals by Chinese companies. But um, um, when it comes to CFIUS uh, uh, risk, um, well, first of all, mo the majority of them never consider the risk. They should. First of all, let, let me take a step back. First of all, uh, CFIUS filing is not mandatory, right? It's optional, right? You, t you assume the risk if you do not file. Uh, under the previous regime. Um, so, um, but still you should consider the risk, right? Uh, every Chinese company should consider risk. But the fact that the majority ha uh, have not uh, uh, suggests that uh, the companies, because of the huge institutional gap, right? They, many of them have not overcome the institution, uh, the information asymmetry. So they, they just have no knowledge about the institution. So uh, less uh, compliance with it or uh, risk consider consideration. So uh, some of them consider CFIUS, uh, but consider it inapplicable to their transaction, which is fine, right? Uh, CFIUS uh, covers, uh, review covers, uh, uh, applies to cover transactions, not all transactions. But uh, the, the two red bars, um, some of them consider CFIUS applicable but did not file for review. So that suggests an uh, opportun uh, opportunistic attitude of Chinese investors towards CFIUS uh, regime, uh, to CFIUS rules. So this is in contrast to tax and unemployment discrimination. Um, so this, uh, this is not important. Um, so perception of the question about whether state ownership matters in this uh, regard. Um, first, uh, perceptions of CFIUS review, um, uh, state owner ownership structure is significant and robust. So that means if you have a Chinese investor, a state owned investor, more likely to consider this uh, system, uh, to, to view this system in a negative light, uh, which makes perfect sense that they are victim to this system. And um, um, whether they have considered CFIUS risk when investing in the U.S. Again, state ownership matters, right? If the investor is owned by Chinese government, they are more likely to have considered the risk. Again, this is uh, intuitive. But this is in contrast to the results from the two previous uh, uh, the two areas, right? Uh, when we talk about tax compliance, employment discrimination compliance, state ownership is not an issue. Um, when it comes to actual filing with CFIUS, state ownership is no longer an uh, issue, which, um, uh, how to explain this? Well, uh, it points uh, by how the rule is, uh, how the law is enforced, right? Uh, state ownership is uh, simply a consideration. Uh, in the end, uh, CFIUS consider the actual national security threat. So if you have a company that's, uh, even though state-owned, but uh, invest in non-sensitive uh, sectors, then there's really no need to file CFIUS review uh, before the investment. So conclusion, um, reactions of Chinese companies to U.S. and institutions. In general, I think Chinese, again, you know, you can draw different conclusions from the empirical findings, but uh, I would argue that most Chinese companies are quite adaptive to U.S. institutions. Um, because uh, in many areas, the institutional gap between China and the U.S. is not that significant um, because of decades of illegal transplants, uh, globalization of the information, uh, and whatnot. So um, Chinese business elites hold very positive views of U.S. institutions. This, again, before Trump, um, so we don't know. Um, so they, they perceive very positively of U.S. institutions enabling free market capitalism. And most are committed to long-term investment in the U.S. They, they really want to become uh, model corporate citizens in the, in the States if given the chance. And they rely heavily on local professionals. This is good news for lawyers and accountants here. Um, but their adaptation varies across different subject matter areas, right? Uh, we see uh, CVS 
the variation across tax, surface review, and uh, employment discrimination. State ownership matters, makes a difference, especially in cases where compliance requires constant localized decision making on issues of significance. If that's the case, then state owned enterprises may not be as effective or as efficient as private Chinese companies in the US. So uh, those are like a lot of findings. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Extrapolate for us to the post, to the current Trump era. What do you think those numbers would look like? And how do you account for the massive fall off in uh, Chinese investment in the United States? It's down by some of them. It's down 80, 90 percent. Yes, yes. So uh, good question. So um, I have the data. Uh, I just haven't got a chance to analyze the data. Um, but. Um, um, it, it's a perception I'm sure it will become less positive. Um, and uh, a lot of companies may second guess or reconsider their long-term commitment to the U.S. market. If that's the case, that may have a detrimental effect on their compliance behavior. On the one hand, they are, they are faced with more compliance pressure. Right now, they are under spotlight, right? Uh, CTE after CTE, uh, US uh, regulatory agencies may pay more attention to Chinese companies in the US, so they probably face more pressure to comply. But on the other hand, they may have less, they, they may not commit to the US market as they did before, and that may have uh, some effect on their, their behavior, uh, 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 compliance behavior. So Aren't tariffs good for Chinese businesses that are already in the United States? Uh, yes and no, right? Uh, of course, uh, if they are already in. Uh, Even if they're not? If what not. do you mean yes and no? What, if I was with the Chinese company last week, and he's an automotive supplier, which would be tariffed if he was exporting from China, but years ago, he set up in the United States to be close to his customers. So he's going, these tariffs are great. Right. These tariffs are actually undercutting because some of his competitors had not set up in the United States. So he's, he says, God, I just got a 10% windfall. I can move my prices 10%. I'm still going to be underselling my competitors. So where's the negative? Right, the negative is uh, the purpose of the investment, right? Sometimes uh, some, Chinese, some Chinese investors invest in the U.S. not to sell to U.S. customers, but to sell back to the Chinese market, right? Uh, if that's the case, then the tariff will have an effect on their business. Um, are there really many who are, who are exporting back to China? Yeah, what well, products? If they, uh, well, some of the companies uh, take advantage of cheap U.S. utility costs uh, or, or other, you know, they, they, they um, uh, take advantage of the advanced the technologies, they set up factories here, but they sell globally, right? And they take it about, they, they have access to the Chinese market, they have knowledge about the market. So they do, some of them do sell uh, uh, to Chinese cu uh, customers, and for them, it's really not good news. The tariff is not good news. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so, so the answer is yes and no. Um, um, I guess for those already in the U.S., and uh, if their market is, in, uh, they, their major goal is to explore the U.S. market, then uh, this may not be a bad news. Huh. Even if it's a global sales, the chances of it being majority China are fairly low. In other words, unlike, unlike the opposite situation where most companies manufacture, U.S. companies manufacturing in China are selling back to the U.S. Or many of them are. Right? Many are, not, not yeah, most. Not all. Yeah, not yeah. All. I think it's, it's, a lot, it's you know, still 20%. Yeah. Chris? Steve, did you ask your Chinese friend where he gets his steel? <laughs> yes, so the steel is going to be, yes. So I the tariffs are, factor. right, 
But the question for, for Professor Lee is, I'm, I'm wondering put if Put a microphone so it can be recorded. In the literature, any, Chris, um, microphone. I'm oh, sorry, okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if the literature gives you any um, uh, comparative data. For example, uh, the, the issue of head office versus local management um, control in different situations is, is commonly experienced in, in uh, American companies operating outside the U.S. who will always complain about their head office and vice versa. Head office always complains that those guys have gone local and are, are an, an, an intolerable risk. Um, so I assume there's a literature on that subject. I wonder if, if you have any comparative uh, data that would, would give us a sense of whether the Chinese are experiencing things like that uh, more severely than other multinational companies, or is it similar? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. There's a huge literature on that. Uh, you know, the general rule of thumb is that uh, when it comes to compliance, uh, you know, the, the headquarters is always more uh, concerned about the risk, right? Risk control. So normally. Uh, local managers will, would uh, uh, have to uh, comply, well, will have to uh, submit uh, the, the compliance decisions to the general compliance office in the headquarters. That's universal, right? Uh, but uh, uh, I, I haven't done any comparative study on that topic. It will be interesting to do in the future. Um, but here, what I found in this study is that uh, on compliance, you have a difference between private company, private Chinese companies and state-owned Chinese companies. Yeah. So that alone suggests that even if in the future we compare uh, Chinese companies with US companies, we probably need to take ownership structure into consideration. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's a good point. I mean, there's, you know, this is only the first step in like a long-term uh, mm -hmm. multiple projects and yeah. the comparative studies will be very interesting and enlightening. Andy, yeah, uh, uh, put a microphone right there. We're very efficient. Um, I want to ask a sort of a more general question because I was really intrigued by the title of the book and the title of this presentation. And so, um, what capitalism to clashing? I mean, if you, you referred in, in there to um, free market capitalism. I assume that's the one that's here in the U.S. What is the capitalism that is competing with what, 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 capitalism of Chinese characteristics? Exactly. What I mean, is there anything different about that? For example, um, in China, I would guess it's also the case that ownership structure is very important in terms of compliance, because probably state owned enterprises comply with, let's say, tax law in China less aggressively than private companies, right? Right, right. All that's the, uh, yes, that's, that's the, the finding so far. That's yeah. the empir empirical finding so far, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, so do Chinese have an idea, or do they have a name for their capitalism? Well, there, uh, yeah, well, there's not a consensus on that. Uh, some people call it crony, cap crony capitalism. Some call it the state capitalism. Some just call it capitalism with Chinese characteristics, but not liberal market capitalism, free market capitalism for sure. So that's yeah. why you, you have the clash of the cap, uh, yeah, of yeah. capitalism. Also, uh, no, known as the question mark. So <laughs> the oh, question yeah, mark. That's the, that's that's that. <laughs> that's a question instead of uh, rather a conclusion. Yeah. Yeah. David. Um, I, I like uh, uh, one term that was used for it is called market Leninism, <laughs> which I think is actually pretty leads to my question, which is the role of the Communist Party now uh, in particularly in state-owned enterprises. Um, uh, do you have any insight, uh, and whether that's increased uh, over the last two, three years with Xi Jinping? Insisting on and how that works on the question of efficiency could make them more effective, but just a sort of a general view about the role of the party and all this. Yeah, I'm a political so, scientist, I don't care about management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, based on my uh, study, uh, the role of the party has increased in the SOEs, that's for sure. Um, 
yeah, uh, um, now um, promotion within the SOEs are ultimately decided by the party. Uh, it used to be, uh, well, um, promotion of uh, managers below the level of minis vice ministry, right? Um, but, uh, used to be decided uh, together uh, by the SOE and, uh, and uh, 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 of the corresponding level. Um, but uh, uh, right now, Zhu and the party... You might translate Zhu Zhu Yeah. <laughs> well, no longer a, exists anymore, right? It's, his name has been changed. What's now the new name for the Zhu Zhu Bu? That's as, as the, the government reorganization. No. Somebody tell me. No change? Is it the party? Yeah. Oh, no, I think it changed. So, yeah, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, the party's uh, role has increased. And the second question, how, what's the impact? Um, well, uh, I don't know whether, uh, I don't know whether the role of the party is the independent factor, or whether it's just uh, uh, together with the impact on the SOE as the dependent var var uh, fact, uh, variable uh, uh, of the general structural change within China, right? Uh, the increase of party role everywhere, right? State control everywhere. Um, that's probably is reflected both in the increase of the party's position in SOEs and um, certain behavioral changes of SOEs in general, right? Um, so, yeah, so <laughs> but uh, yeah, those are the general answers. Um, uh, uh, well, the third question is how they impact the, their operations in the US, right? Um, well, uh, so far I haven't, well, um, again, uh, you know, the uh, SOEs in the US are now taking a more conservative approach towards their U.S. investment, right? Uh, Bank of China, for example, had this idea of expanding to uh, mm -hmm. Texas, setting up a Houston office, a Houston branch. They stopped, right, um, because, um, well, but, but it's hard to say whether it's because of the general market environment or because uh, the government decided to take a more conservative uh, uh, approach to investment in the U.S. So, we have to do, again, you know, if we want to nail down the answer, we have to do more systematic empirical research. Yeah. Bill, back there. I'm Bill Armbruster, retired journalist. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, roughly how many Chinese companies are doing business here in the U.S., and of those, roughly what percentage are state owned? Right, so that, I think that's a question for Steve. They have. Uh, I don't know the answer. <laughs> they have. They, 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 the Rudium Group uh, published the report each year with you know, uh, data of the universe of Chinese investment in the US. But for, for me, we, we only, uh, we, I did, uh, this is an empirical research based on a sample of Chinese investor, investors in the US. Well, we don't know. Uh, we don't know the universe. We don't know the, the population. So, um, because it's hard to define, right? If you define Chinese investment in the, in the U.S. broadly, then a lot of Chinese uh, individuals have set up uh, businesses in the U.S. Many of them do it in order to get a green card, uh, right? And. Uh, uh, many of them just uh, do it uh, to, to diversify their investment portfolio. So if you define it, uh, the term broadly, then there can be thousands, thousands of that. But do you have any idea roughly what percentage are state-owned? Well, uh, based on my vague memory of actually my reading of the Rudium uh, research, I think the uh, less than 50% uh, was by yeah. SOEs. So increasingly, private company, private in investors from China uh, is taking. Uh, but take first, over. we have a one million dollar threshold. <laughs> so you, if it's a small company, it doesn't right. count in our data. Yeah. And number two, it's only investment. So if you set up an office here to do business, 
you're not counted in the Rhodium National Committee data. So it's, and it's quite, it shifted from the early years when it was predominantly state-owned investment to now when it's, it's uh, I think in the 2017 data, it's probably 25% or 30% that's state-owned, 70% that's private. But it's, it's um, again, it's, it's a million and above. So it's, um, it's not, right. people do, if you're trading, if you're doing other kinds of businesses, you don't, you don't do it. We had all sorts of issues. There's a, you know, we, we were trying to look, in one of our reports, we were trying to look at employment generation. So it really, the view was how do we count the number of Americans who are employed by Chinese companies? And I think that most recent number is 140,000. But what we didn't count was interestingly there somebody pointed out that there is this uh, English language uh, service where you literally Chinese pay to talk to an American and there are apparently right. 75,000 Americans who are on this and receive payments from Chinese who basi basically you speak English. It's, it's an English language instruction. Um, firm. What's it, anybody remember the name? Um, it's online. It's online. Right. What's it called? Yeah, VIP, kids. Uh, VIP kids. Yeah, it's the, the, the VIP kids. Yeah, it's something like that. So it and it's it, it generates enormous amount of, of revenue for the the kids or the people who it doesn't it could be a retired person it could be anybody. But we don't count that in our data. <laughs> so our data. I, w I think it's the best data available, but it's not perfect. All right. Last question. Yep. Thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering if you could walk us through how a lawyer would advise Chinese investors on whether or not to do the CFIUS filing um, and how this kind of uh, actual security threat is kind of uh, assessed by a lawyer trying to give the best advice to clients and how that, you know, whether it's private investors or state-owned investment company. Right. And um, how that might be changing. Well, Paul here is actually the expert on that. Uh, Paul. Uh, That's a great doing that. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I, I can just give you like a, a bird view uh, answer to that. Um, uh, Basically, um, uh, so lawyers consider several factors. One, whether the ownership structure of the Chinese investor, if it's an SOE, they'll be more uh, cautious. Right? Uh, that's, a, that's a major consideration for CVS. Cautious in what way? Oh, they, they will more likely advise the Chinese investor to file, or to consider, at least to consider CVS risk more seriously. And second, um, the type of investment. Right. If it, wh which, which sector is the Chinese company invests. Um, some sectors are more sensitive than others. Uh, if a ch company, even if state-owned, invests in a textile factory in North Carolina, there's no need uh, for serious review. But if uh, investing in a high-tech company, a startup high-tech company, uh, then yeah, well, CPS file is probably uh, necessary. And the third, well, location, right? Whether the, invest, the target is located near a military facility or not, uh, or whether it touches on uh, infrastructure, critical infrastructure. Those are the considerations. There's a long list, right? Um, and Paul. Yeah. The whole landscape changed recently. Oh, the whole landscape changed in August with the enactment of what's the acronym is firm. And uh, the key issue is national security activities, such as, and, and that's defined as it, uh, dealing with critical infrastructure or critical technology or personal sensitive data. And those concepts have existed before, but they're clearly going to be expanded. The other thing that the law did was dealt with minority investments and other greenfield investments. So it's been broadened significantly. And uh, there was not a consensus in Washington on all these things. So they left a lot to regulation and gave Commerce 18 months to come up with regulations. So we're in a no man's land. As to some of the standards, we know that even though the terminology is the same, 
we know it's going to be broad as far as scope. But how do you go about determining those things? You look at, there's questionnaires uh, that you hand out, you look at the backgrounds of things mentioned, you look at location, you look at uh, uh, on, the acquirers, on the acquiring company side, all the activity, you know, what they do, what they've got in the contracts. Uh, and then you have to make a determination whether any of this stuff fall, it is a national security activity. And if you're on, if you're on the bubble, we don't know, we're really not sure how to advise clients at this point in time. Because we're in the yeah. um, interesting note to close on. But thank you very much for the book, and thank you very thank much you. for giving generously of your time.